There are times that I may slip up, won't always get it right Guarantee I'll be on top when it's game said life Get up and show up, don't ever lose your fight You watching me from the couch, at least I say I tried A long time ago, someone said this stuck with me Passion with that action will only remain a dream Keep positive, motivated people on your team Cause other negativity can kill your self-esteem Believing is powerful, but sadly so is doubt So you can choose which way you wanna go, which route The mind that controls the body can beat anybody And gotta be all in, don't treat your dreams like a hobby And if you practice on your day off, won't have an off day Talent alone won't get you there, still got a long way Gotta take big risks and big steps to strive Wanna be the winner when it's game set live Whoa. And we are back in action on Apple TV. You could catch Macy and Meltzer with Game Set Life. We are so blessed to be here. Mr. Macy, it's your time of year. I am uh, fully engaged watching tennis right now. I uh, thought maybe we'd start there with some of your thoughts midsummer on what's going on. Yeah, well, obviously, Wimbledon. And you know what people don't understand about Wimbledon, it's it's a different sport. You know, think of running on a putting green that's really, really hard and a tennis ball going 100 miles an hour skidding. So that's why you see some players, even though they're top 10 in the world, they exit stage left real early because it's just not suitable for their game. And that's why I go to the joker who is the goat, you know, the Serbian goat. I mean, the guy wins on every surface. His feet are nimble. You know, he's going to be, he, David, he's going to be tough to beat. He's won the last four of these things. He's won seven of them. You know, the guy is amazing mentally. Okay. And he embraces it. And he's the goat because grass is high in fiber and most goats like fiber. So, you know, there you go. So, no, Wimbledon, it's, it's a different animal. People just don't realize it's almost a different sport. Because you win a point so easily with a serve. And there's all these subtle nuances that the regular tennis player doesn't understand how fast the ball goes. And you play kind of different than you would obviously on clay or even hardcore. That's why you got to admire someone like this Djokovic cat. Oh, yeah. And speaking of exit early, our favorite woman tennis player exited early. Seemed very frustrated because she's such a tough competitor. Give us a little bit of insight on... Uh, number one, what you think happened there, and two, uh, you know, her mindset is still, you know, I know what it's like to get old. You may know what it's like to get old. Sometimes our bodies don't do what our minds uh, telling us uh, we can do or we should do. Uh, you're talking about the great VW, right? Oh yeah. Listen, she turned pro at age 14. Okay, she made her debut at 14 years old and here we are at 43 and she's playing Wimbledon and she's highly competitive. But the thing about her playing on grass, and this is what I told everybody long ago, um, it kind of makes you go forward and your serve, you get more value. The volley, if you hit a good one, it's great. If you hit a bad one, it's good. If you hit a bad one, it's okay. So the, the grass kind of makes you more aggressive the points are shorter and you got firepower. So, but about Venus, the fact that she still loves the battle. And you know, David, you've worked with so many athletes. It's hard to let go. You know, it's not about winning. She knows she's not going to win the tournament, but she just loves the competition and she can still hang in there with the best players in the world on grass because she has that 130 mile an hour serve. You know, she has enough firepower, but I tell everybody, the mental fortitude of this young lady is like no other. She's only played a couple of matches the whole year. That's just enter a grand slam and I'm going to kick your butt. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is, you know how you need to play a lot and build confidence and you got excuses and you need repetition. You got to admire that of both, both her and Serena. They just showed up because they knew how to compete. No yeah. excuses in the Williams family. I, I just, I love Venus, everything she stands for. And she had the quote of all time. She goes, I really like to play till I'm 50. Okay, right. she was play till she's 50. Listen, never count out the great VW, one of my favorite students of all time. Yeah, well, Tom Brady wanted to do the same thing. And 
Uh, unfortunately for him, he didn't make it either. And I still think, you know, my favorite longevity goat is the incredible Warren Moon, uh, who cannot be forgotten since I always bring him up. But think about when, you know, my, my buddy Warren Moon played uh, six seasons up there in the CFL, five Grey Cups, MVP of the Rose Bowl, of course, MVP of the Grey Cup, and then played another 17 years in what was a different game of football. Uh, as a quarterback where you could hit not only the quarterback, but you could hit the wide receivers and bump and run. And it was a much more aggressive game. And to think about playing and starting in the NFL at 44 years ago, way back when in 2001, uh, you know, that's buddy 22 years ago. And uh, I can't even imagine if Tom Brady couldn't make it to 50 here 20 years later, uh, you know, Warren Moon with the rules and the conditioning and the diet. I, I always wonder if, if he would have been the satchel page of football and been able to play till uh, he was 50. Do you think Serena or v Venus could play till they're 50? It depends on the injuries. You know, I think definitely on a faster surface where the points are shorter and that Compton firepower comes into play, you know, one and done, two of the best serves ever in the history of tennis. You know, you win points quicker, you get confidence quicker, your opponents get demoralized quicker, and they know that you got all those Wimbledons in your back pocket. So, yeah, I, I if they're healthy, okay, don't even count out Serena, you know what I mean, after she has her baby. I mean, they're, they're amazing. I mean, they're amazing. And I think if they play doubles, they would still contend because, you know, you're only covering half the court. It's serve, yeah. return, you know. They never really played doubles. I told everybody this. They just went for the jugular, and it was a Compton street fight. It wasn't like your classic doubles. They they just went at you. It was amazing the way they played. But they're just two special ladies. But I think it's between the ear. You know, tennis is a game of inches, like a lot of sports, ear to ear. But to go there and believe that you can win. And, you know, to me, that's that's more important. What's their, their minds all about? Because they don't need to do it, but they do it because they want to compete and they love to play. And, and that should always, and David, that's the wild card with any great athlete. That's how you handle pressure. When you're all about the competition, okay, you, I don't want to say you're 100% bulletproof, but you handle pressure better because you're not worried about all the outside noise and you're just locked in because you're just in that bubble. I love to compete. You're not worried about anything else. And, no one could do it better than the Compton Comets. That's awesome. Now, books wise, you know, uh, it's interesting because we have, you know, audio books, we have Kindles, and of course, we have the old school written books. Uh, you know, you've had so many different champions in your life. Were there some consistent books that people were reading uh, to help them with either confidence, leadership, winning? What were some of the most inspirational books that either you recommended or you saw players reading? Well, there's actually two when people ask me about books and they go way back in time. The Inner Game of Tennis with Tim Galloway. Everybody loved the book. They didn't know anything what it meant. That's what was crazy about it. Because he was like, there's a there's a, a being within a being and how to handle things. You know what I mean? And trying not to try. It was very deep, way beyond his time but it applied to all sports. And I always recommended that. But one of my best buddies of all time, the great Dr. James Lair, okay, he was a pioneer. We did a lot of stuff, believe it or not, David, with the corporate structure, okay, with business people in the early 80s, you know, about how to handle stuff, about visualization. And we kind of got into the tennis part a little later uh, in the 80s. But Jim was a pioneer. He's like 80 years old now. People have rewrapped sports psychology, as you know, through the years, but the leader in the clubhouse, the first of the Mohicans is Dr. James Lair, mental toughness training. Okay. He's helped so many players. Uh, it's unbelievable. And you know, what I learned from him, which I was very fortunate at a young age. Okay. Um, really helped me in my career because it was about the mental part of the game about rituals, the slowing things down in your mind, having the ability to forget, you know, the way he approached everything was from a psychological point of view. And there was a lot of common threads the way I grew up. I have to do it on my own. And I never 
knew this was like a formula. I thought it was like a natural thing to do. But Jim kind of gave you a step-by-step -step program. Uh, he's the best of the best. Dr. James E. Lair, mental toughness training, one of the best all-time sellers. Well, I was having a conversation. I'm here in Italy with uh, our favorite young athlete, Miles. And uh, he's a little bit frustrated because he can't get out onto the range. He can't play golf. And I said, hey, pick your favorite par three, your favorite par four, and your favorite par five and play them in your head. Can you know play it again and again? Uh, I know uh, I read a story about a, uh, a prisoner of war who uh, played every day his home course in his mind. He was in a three by six, you know, box basically being tortured. But every day he would play 18 holes and uh, he played nine strokes below his handicap when he got back uh, and shot par by visualizing uh, playing. And uh, have you had the same type of uh, when an athlete gets injured or maybe in a slump, have you utilized visualization in any way in order to effectuate the same kind of progress? Absolutely. Big time. You know, I know stories. I don't know the guy, but he broke both his arms. OK. And he visualized, you know, for about 20 minutes a day shooting foul shots. OK. And when he came back and had both arms, his percentage was much higher. All right. <laughs> then when he had two arms, you know, and the great Novak Djokovic every single day, it's part of the routine. He pictures himself holding the trophy. He pictures himself hitting ground stroke side to side. He pictures himself hitting the great shot. He makes these moments live and in color in his mind happening before it's happening, you know, and the great point guards of all times. Okay. They visualize because they have that imagination and creativity anyways. They picture this stuff, okay, like all great athletes. And people don't do it because people in general are lazy and it's kind of boring and you're not sweating. They'd rather do the physical part. But then they all agree, it's all mental. It's all mental. You know, right. they all agree, but they don't want to spend the discipline, whether it be on, on yoga or meditation or mind control. But visualization is so powerful. I mean, I do it all the time. And people have to understand that old saying, seeing is believing and believing is magic. Absolutely. And it's magic with Rick Macy. And our next guest is extremely magic. I will tell you one thing about sweating and visualizing. If you visualize while you're in Florida in the middle of summer or Italy, I promise you, you will break a great sweat no matter where you are, because it is hot as blank here in Italy. And I know it's even hotter there in Florida. Uh, but more importantly, we got the humble being himself. This man is vulnerable. He is honest and he is empowering and inspiring people from the mistakes of his past, but giving meaning in a trajectory of a future that is bright and empowering other people uh, in their lives to learn from his journey. Uh, I met this guy and he blew me away. I wish I was closer to him geographically because he's so active. We got to do more step on more stages together. We are blessed to have, I know you were fired up last week, Damon West, welcome to Game Set Life. Hey, man, Damon, what's happening, brother? Rick, what's going on, man? How are you, man? I'm doing great. I'm honored to hear on the show. It's great. Man, I'm right, honored Dave. to be on with you two guys. And look, man, speaking of hot, Dave, boy, I'm, he's in Florida, you're in Italy, I'm in Texas, man. It is hot. <laughs> I just got back from a jog, man. It's uh 2.15 in the afternoon, but... You can get a good sweat that way in Texas. You you are glowing, my buddy. Well, we have a tradition here on Game Set Life, uh, and uh, Rick Macy is the king. We're thinking about getting our own rap deal, but you're going to see one of the best introductions from a, a man who's over 60 years old. He's going to bring it for you. So I'm just warning you, here comes one of the best introductions you're ever going to get. Rick Dude. Macy, as, as our boy Nick says, hit it. <laughs> All right, Damon, listen, we got all these common threads. We've had so many people on the show. I read your story. Fasten your seatbelt. We're going back down memory lane. Let me start it off here, okay? Thomas Jefferson, football star, major league talent like Abdul Jabbar. Crazy decisions that caused almost death, all because of the highly addictive crystal meth. Jennifer Capriotti had a match with drugs, came back to number one with positivity 
and media earplugs. DM was also a football achiever, cornerback and wide receiver. DM came all the way back, now collecting a stack of Jack. Number two, all right? Going to prison became your best friend. It helped you men. A new beginning, not an end. Most of all, a powerful message you now send. Serena, with her style, put you in jail. No bail. Ground stroke she could nail. Now you'd check in the mail. Akron's greatest, never incarcerated, but unreal educated, highly motivated, extremely dedicated, the world stimulated. Number three, 65 years in the slammer. You got the hammer. God damn her. But this quarterback in seven years shed a lot of tears, became a new man. The entire world is now your biggest fan. Venus was the ultimate slammer. Opponents would get the jammer. VW loved glamour over 65 times and seven grand slams. Her challenges were artificial lambs. DM built like a sledgehammer. Okay. Wizard at grammar. His heart's in the right place. Ohio's finest with Rick Mace. All right. And number four, the last one, tremendous motivator with delicious meat on the bone, flying high like a drone, showing the world how to live. Your best buddy is Mr. Positive. Serena was motivated, refusing to lose, up at five, never snooze. Now the goat can pick and choose. And the last one, Meltzer Magic has motivated billions around the planet. David's message, rock solid as granite. Game set life teams up with only the best. It's an honor to welcome. It's showtime with Damon West. Brother, that is amazing. <laughs> I mean, dude, lights out the best introduction ever. Like, we got to go on the road together, Rick. All right. <laughs> yeah. You got man. it. You're going to be on the road a lot. I'm on the yeah. road. I'm your pitch man. You're the quarterback. I'll do the blocking. Let's go. 80% of the year, I'm on the road, man. About 24 days of the month, I'm on the road. So, Rick, pack a bag. Pack a couple of bags. We're going, brother. All right. You got you it. Got, you got the Rick Macy hoodies. He'll be fine. He'll just swap them out every day. He got SW. He got VW. Now he got DW. Uh, he's the king with the dubs. And, uh, Damon, I thought we'd start off for those who don't know you, and you should get to know Damon West if you want to – change the way you look at things so the things you look at change for the better in your life uh damon's story is one that will blow your mind and so uh usually i'm a little bit more inquisitive but i love uh to hear the story on how and where you got this positivity this inspiration because uh you have like me ridden the roller coaster uh, of life and you are back on top and there to stay uh, let us know how you got that way. Yeah, man. You see, you're rhyming, and it's like in my mind, I've got this cadence where I feel like I need to rhyme my story. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to... <laughs> this is the mid, the middle aged gangster rappers, Rick. I mean, Mason like I'm, I'm off my game a little bit because I'm trying to figure out how to rap and make it rhyme. So, no, guys, listen. Um, first of all, thank you all both for for the opportunity to come here and, and share with everybody today. Uh, you know, I think the world of both y'all, and just to be in the same room with y'all virtually, even. Is, uh, is incredible, guys. Um, listen, my story, you know, the best place to start this thing out is almost exactly 15 years ago today when we're recording this. It was July 30th, 2008. And I was in this little rundown apartment in Dallas that day. And I was sitting on this little ratty old couch and I, and I had my meth dealer sitting next to me. It was His name is Tex, my dope dealer. And I'm telling Tex that day, Tex, you don't want to be here, man. The cops are closing in on me. The end is near, man. They Ten days before this, the Dallas Police Department just arrested my partner in crime in a stolen car. So he's talking, man, because everybody talks in crime. No one keeps their mouth shut when they start throwing big numbers around. I know they're coming to get me. And just about that time, the window on my right blows out and shatters. And, and tumbling across my living room floor was a little canister going end over end. It's smoking on one side. Man, I've seen this movie before. I know what the canister is going to do. And, guys, I'm trying to get out of the, out of the living room as fast as I can, but it's too late. Boom. The flashbang grenade blows up in my face. Bright white light, loud noise. 
pulls me back on the couch. And when I came to, when I can see and hear again, there's a cop standing over me in full SWAT riot gear. He's got his boot on my chest. The barrel of an assault rifle is digging in my eye socket. The cop's finger is over the trigger, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs, don't move, don't move. And, and man, I scream back at him at the top of my lungs, don't worry, don't worry. You've got a gun in my eye, man. And so one of these cops comes into that apartment that day, and he screams that out loud, we got him. We got the uptown burglar. And they did. They had me. That's what they called. They called me the Uptown Burglary. The crime spree that I committed was called the Uptown Burglary Crime Spree for the Uptown neighborhood of Dallas, where a bunch of other meth addicts and myself broke into homes for about three years. And guys, listen, I'm guilty of everything they said. I, my, through my crime spree, I created a lot of victims along the way. Now, my victims were never physically hurt. No one was ever home. I never saw them. They never saw me. No one was physically hurt. But I hurt people in different ways. Uh, one of the ways I know that I hurt my victims is I, when I broke into people's homes, I didn't just steal their property. I stole their sense of security. And I don't know if my victims ever regained that in life. But they, uh, they sent me to Dallas County Jail that day. They put me in there with a, a $1.4 million bond. Ten months later, I go to my trial and the jury sentences me to life in prison. And right after the trial was over that day in, in May of 2009, my mom has this conversation with me. It's an ultimatum conversation. She said, Damon, you can't go into prison and get into one of these white hate groups, one of these Aryan Brotherhood type of gangs. You were never raised to be a racist. You're not going to start now. She even said you can't get any tattoos while you're in there. And, and guys, I show people my sleeves all the time. man. I'm, I'm ink free. I don't have any tats on this body. Because my mom told me this. She said, no gangs, no tattoos. You come back as the man we raised or don't come back to us at all. Guys, I'm floored. I don't know how I'm going to do this because every guy in county jail is telling me you got to get into a gang. In fact, I'm waiting for the prison bus to come pick me up. And there's this old black guy in county jail, this old guy named Mr. Jackson. And he told me, he said, if you want to survive prison and come back on the other side as the man your parents raised, then you're going to have to be a coffee bean. And that's when he shares with me. He said, prison is like a pot of warm water. He said, you have three choices of how you're going to respond to this pot of warm water we call prison. He said, you can be like the carrot that goes in hard, but becomes soft. You can be like the egg that goes in with that soft liquid core, but that core, that inner, that inner core becomes hard, hardened the inside, like a hard boiled egg. He said, or you can be a coffee bean because a coffee bean changes the pot of boiling water into a pot of coffee. He said, the coffee bean is the only thing that can change the water. Carrots are changed by the water. Eggs are changed by the water, not a coffee bean. A coffee bean changes the water because it is a change agent. And so he told me when the prison bus, prison bus was going to pick me up, four words, be a coffee bean. Y'all, that was the four words that were bouncing around my head as they took me to a maximum security prison in Beaumont, Texas, called the Mark Stiles Unit, one of the toughest prisons in Texas. And for two months, I fought for my right to exist in that place. And after that was over and I established myself inside the prison, I got to work on myself, guys, and, and I became that coffee bean. And it was hard. It didn't happen overnight. It's something that, like I tell people in life, you know, life is a long time to live. But if we get up every day and we look at life, not when we look, when we get to the adversity in life, and we don't look at the adversity as something that's that's bad, something that happened to us, and we change the mindset of it happening for us. Every single day in life, good and bad, is happening for us to become the best versions of us. And, and like our friend Ed Milet says, Ed says that, on the other side of the adversity is the best version of you, but you have to go through the adversity to meet that best version of you. And that's who I met inside of a maximum security prison. I met the best version of Damon West because, David, we talked about this before. I had a spiritual awakening inside that place. It was like going in as a caterpillar and coming out as a butterfly. The spiritual awakening that I had was unmatched by anything I've ever been through any, anywhere else in life. And Seven years and three months into that life sentence, the parole board came to visit me and um, they wanted to meet the guy that they said not only changed himself, but changed the entire prison. They had one question for me that day. And the lady from parole said, she said, this is a one question test. And the question is this. If you could be remembered for being anything in life, anything at all, she said, tell me what that would be in just one word. Go. Y'all, I breathed out and I relaxed. That's an easy question for a coffee bean. And I fired her answer back at her. I was like, ma'am, useful. I just want to be useful. And I can be useful inside this prison, as you've already seen. Or I could be useful in the free world again, finding more coffee beans. 
November 16th, 2015, seven and a half years ago, I walked out of that Texas prison. Now, I'm not a free man. You're not looking at a free man in front of you. I've got a little more time left on parole in the state of Texas. I'm on parole until the year 2073. So I got about 50 more years left on this parole that I'm serving. But guys, listen, man, I'm a coffee bean. The only way I'm going back to prison is when I go to prisons all over America. I share this story with the men and women in there to bring hope on their journeys. And I walk out the front gate of every prison today. Damn, Damon, I, you know, I'm listening to the story for fourth or fifth time live uh, with you. And it still moves me like none other. And uh, every time I listen to it, I'm in a different place. I'm a different person because I'm continually trying to grow every day incrementally that aggregates. So each time I see you, I have a different mindset. You know, I'm studying time a lot. And I heard this remarkable thing that shocked me about time. And it resonated when you were telling your story to me. When we signed, it was July 4th, when we signed the Declaration of Independence, there was still fighting for seven years. And I, I put my mindset into, okay, you know, we today, hundreds of years later, we look back and say, oh, you know, we were independent July 4th, and yet for seven years, people were still fighting for their freedom, uh, like killing people for their freedom. They're, we're still fighting t today, and, and we know what, what, what that freedom looks like. But more importantly, they, they, they still didn't consider themselves free for seven years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. For two months, you had to fight for your life. And it, you, you skipped over it very quickly about, you know, hey, after that two months, but that's a long F in two months. And I would love to know your mindset, you know, day 16, that you didn't know it would ever stop or if you were going to live. You know, what was it in your mind that said, I'm a coffee bean? It's not going to matter. Here's what it is, David. Great question, first of all, because... Time is the, the one relative thing to all of us. It's a great equalizer. And everybody has to obey time. So when I got to prison, right before I got there, Mr. Jackson, the guy that told me the story of the coffee bean in the county jail, he told me a lot of other things, too. He was like a coach along the way. And which, by the way, David, since we talked last, I, I found Mr. Jackson. He's actually he's passed away, but I found his family and I started a scholarship out in his name. So we honor him today in, uh, in, in a, a, a scholarship that I started in his name. But uh one of the things he told me in Dallas County Jail, he said, he said, you don't have to win all your fights, but you do have to fight all your fights. And he said, what this means is that some days you're going to win and some days you're going to lose. He said, you're going to get your ass kicked a lot inside that prison. He said, but don't worry about it. No one cares about your wins and losses. What everybody's watching to see is, is he going to get back up and fight again? Because the minute you stop getting back up and fighting again, they're all going to come devour you. It's a very predatory environment in prison. But, you know, David, the same is true in life. You know, no one counts our wins and losses. No one but us. We keep track of that sometimes in our heads. No one's paying attention to that. But what everybody does watch to see, does he or she get back up when the adversity of life hits? And, you know, you're asking about the mindset that I was in about day 16. Look, man, every single day I got up and all I wanted to do was just make it through that one day. And some days... Uh, some days were better than others. I'd be lying to you if I had this, you know, if I said I had this great outlook on life, I was surviving at that point. You know, I haven't, by this point, when I first, in the first two months in the prison, I haven't gotten into AA, the program recovery that I credit with so many of the changes in my life. None of that stuff's happened by then. It is merely just surviving and existing on some days. And some days, David, some days I don't even leave my cell because I don't want to get into a fight that day because I'm banged up from the day before. So I just go without eating a meal because you have to go down to the chow hall to eat a meal three times a day. But there's some days I would just starve as opposed to fight. And that's that's sometimes what life does. Yeah. But everything that was happening to me in that prison was really happening for me. And, and let me explain that, because although it was the toughest two months I've ever been through in my life. And, and the, the, the one time in my life that I thought I was going to die many different times, I thought I was going to die, that I wouldn't make it. What I did find out is I found out that I've got a lot of perspective on what a bad day looks like. And now in this life that I have today, now that I've made it this far, every day that I wake up, David, and my feet don't hit the cold concrete floor of the prison cell, I'm winning. I'm having a good day. I don't care what's going on in my life. 
Everybody has that perspective though, right? We know what a bad day looks like. You know, a bad day, man, that's when that's when a marriage fails. That's when a job is lost, a bankruptcy happens. Days, you know these days, David, you've been through some of those kind of days or a child gets hurt, someone dies. Man, those are bad days. Most of our days aren't those kind of days. It's like our, it's our mindset is everything, David. You know, sometimes you sit in traffic and the traffic doesn't bother you at all, but other times you sit in traffic and it bothers you so much. Is it the traffic or is it you? And it's always us. It's always the way we see the world around us and where we are. Like you said, you're in a different space right now hearing this story again for another time. Things have happened in your life that have changed your perspective. But all of us know what a bad day looks like. And most of our bad days aren't really bad days. We have to tap into that, though, David. That's the that's one of the tricks in my life is like I've always got to remind myself this isn't prison. man. Speaking of heat too, Texas prison system, there's no air conditioning. There's no AC in a Texas prison. <laughs> All the heat, the heat that people are feeling right now in the world, and you look at a hot, it's 110 degrees, right? And I, I'm four miles from my old prison, David. I went right by, I went jogging by it today. I waved at the guys in the rec yard, they waved back. But Texas prisons don't have air conditioning. It's a very hard environment. That's amazing. Let, wow. David, let me, let me jump in here and back the truck up. Damon, can you talk a little bit about your wiring, your, your mom and dad? You know, you were brought up high level athlete, went to North Texas State, quarterback, you know, a leader, all that stuff prior to the problems, how that helped you, because that never leaves any of us. It's in there. It mm -hmm. might disappear for a while. How did all that competitiveness and how you were brought up help you uh, in the long run? Yeah. And I'm going to throw in, I'm going to throw a sports name at y'all from the 70s that you're probably going to remember. Back in 1971, my dad was a sports writer for 50 years, and he was a and he got famous because he was the first sports writer in Southeast Texas to put black athletes on the front page of sports pages. 1971 wow. was the first time it happened. There was a running back from Port Arthur Lincoln High School named Joe Washington Jr. I remember him. Yeah, wore the silver shoes, played for OU, went on to play for the Redskins, played for the Colts. Well, Joe Washington Jr. is an All American in his high school year, his senior year of '71, and. And my dad was the first sports writer to, because he said, you know, Joe was the best athlete in the country. And every time Joe got to be on, deserved to be on the front page, he was on the front page. And the first time it ever happened, uh, people lost their minds in Southeast Texas over there. They broke with my dad. They broke my dad's windows out. They slid his tires. They sent him hate mail over and over over the years. He got tons of hate mail because he gave black athletes the front page. When I was a little boy, I was probably eight years old, Rick. My dad goes up in the attic one day and he comes down with this box with all these these envelopes and these letters. It was all the hate mail. So he sits me down on the couch that day as a little eight-year-old boy, and he makes me read every letter of hate mail, every nasty, negative word that people said about my father and my mother, because my dad puts a black guy on the cover of the sports page. But my dad told me this back then, Rick. He said, I want you to see, Damon, what it looks like to take a stand and do the right thing. Because he said, sometimes taking a stand and doing the right thing it means you're going to stand alone. But it, but he said it's always okay to stand alone as long as you are standing on the right side of history. Now, this is one of the biggest principles I had to rebuild my life on 25 years later when I go to prison for the first time in my life, scared to death. But it was that idea of standing alone. And, and my dad being a sports guy, listen, I was exposed to a lot of sports at a very young age. And, and sports teaches us so many lessons about life, doesn't it? I mean, you learn how to win. You learn how to lose. You learn how to be on the team. You learn how to work hard. You learn how to put in the work. And, and these are lessons that I learned from all the different sports that I played. Sports shaped my life a lot. Being in locker rooms shaped my life tremendously. And, Damon, you know, you're the, the golden boy of Texas. You know, you are an amazing quarterback, uh, played quarterback in college, which is, you know, no small feat. Uh, there, I believe, what, Texas A&M or – yeah, but played at North Texas. I got hurt North against Texas A&M. Yeah, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. You got North to, you got. So, you know, I always, I'm always curious. Uh, you know, a guy who comes from such a good family, quarterback, a D1 quarterback, a leader. I mean, quarterbacks in college are presidential in nature. They're presidential in nature. They they're the epitome of leaders. It's believe it or not, what Nike looks for when they're trying to sell their stuff. They're looking for that kid. Uh, is who sells their stuff the most. If they're wearing Nike, Nike's in heaven. Uh, how do you go from 
your family, you, you know, I, I get I get kids that are surrounded, you know, by the the, the influences that, that lead them there. They have nothing to lose. They're dealing drugs or using they have nothing to lose. But you you had everything. And yet you fell into this trap. How does that happen? And what advice do you give kids today? How easy it is to fall into that trap? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, you know, I'm hit with the the question about how it all began um, quite often. And here's the deal. I got into substance abuse at a young age. I was 10 the first time I drank a beer, 12 the first time I smoked a joint. I had, I had a lot of character issues. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I was not a great guy. I was a very cocky, arrogant guy. You know, quarterbacks have an edge about them. And there's a fine line between, between being confident and being a real cocky, arrogant uh, guy. And I was a cocky and arrogant guy growing up, but because I could throw a football so well, David, this is Texas, man, Texas high school football. That's a religion in my home state, man. We worship on Friday nights. That's what, that's the night we all go to church on Friday night. And, um, and because I was the man, a lot of my behaviors got swept under the rug. I never had to answer for the things I did. I mean, like you said, quarterbacks are kind of presidential in nature. And this is true. This is David. That's a very true statement. I've never heard it put like that. But by the time I was 20 years old in college, I became the starting quarterback there, too. And, and you know, I, I really thought I had arrived. My head was really, really big. But but life gives us these days that I call fork in the roads. And the fork in the road for me was the day that I got hurt against Texas A&M in 96. And when I got hurt against A&M in 96, I didn't just lose my football career. It was a career and an injury. I lost my identity because everything in my life was wrapped up. My identity was wrapped up in being a football player. And when that was removed from me, that 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 external thing I attached to, see, I didn't understand back then. You can't attach to something external to make your identity. It has to come from within. But once that was gone, the wheels came off. And in all the home training and all the, the good parenting that I got from not just my parents, but from the coaches and the town that raised me, that was out the window because I could not deal with life on life's terms. And because I got into substance abuse at a very young age, when I couldn't deal with life and life's term after the injury, I turned to drugs to change the way I felt. I put in chemicals to change the way I felt. But it was more hardcore than just drinking and smoking pot. It was cocaine, ecstasy, and pills. But, you know, I was a functional addict, graduated college, and went off to work, and then eventually became a stockbroker. And that's where I was a broker in Dallas when I got hooked on meth. But I had always been around drugs, but I'd always been around the culture that I couldn't, I could not get any in trouble. But Look, man, we all have to answer for the things we do. And I tell people all the time that that debts demand to be paid. And if you owe a debt, you're going to have to pay it. But I didn't understand that until 2009 when a jury sentenced me to life. First felony conviction ever, by the way, David. I've never had a felony before that. That was the first felony ever. Wow. Rick, bring us home, man. What do you got? No, first off, you know, taking such a crazy negative, turn into positive. I love how you can just empower the world because this is bottom line hardcore the real world okay and the more people you can touch you have no idea how you're going to change so many lives this is dave this is so powerful i love it yeah i think of dennis waitley who was one of my mentors uh, at a young age when i was arrogant on the financial side of things and you know he said to me he said oh he said i go you know mr waitley i said you you may be a legend but i can outsell you I don't need this advice, you know, on how to sell. I've, I've been in selling since I was a kid. I'm number one in a multi-billion dollar company. You know, I appreciate you coming in here, but I, I really don't need this. And he said, son, I'm just planting seeds under trees that I may never sit under. And uh, I'm blessed that Dennis Waitley's still alive today. Uh, and he gave me a huge compliment last time he saw me. He said, I'm so blessed to sit under a tree that I planted a seed under. And I said, oh, wow. so I, I said my humility uh, for the lessons you taught me. I wasn't ready to hear them. Wasn't ready to hear them, but they they stuck with me. They were planted. And the reason I bring that off is I see the same thing. Rick Macy does that every day. Starts at 5 a.m. And Damon, you're doing it every day. And both of you inspire me to do it every day to enjoy that consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential, but bring it out of other people as well. And uh, you guys are building champions and blessed to be on this court with both of you at Game Set Life. Damon, let's do more. As I always say, I'll see you at some airport, I'm sure, but you're always on my list. Definitely, brother. I love you, David. Rick, love you, man. Thanks a lot for the opportunity, guys. Stay I'm cool, David. Thanks for yeah. sharing.
We're going to do something together. Let's do it, man. I'm, yeah. I'm on the road. Let's go. All, All right. right. Showtime. See you. See you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, Damon West, Game Set Life. Rick Macy, unbelievable. This season's been incredible. As always, what's your takeaway of the day? Yeah, listen, everybody has to understand. When we back up a little bit here, everything around him started to diminish. But the moral of the story is it's not where you start. It's where you finish. That's my takeaway. I love it. It doesn't matter if you have the heart. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have the lead as long as you have the heart to come from behind. I, I took away, you know, that idea of, you know, things happening to you. And I think it happens in sports a lot, Rick. You see this with world-class tennis players when they get injured, right? This happened to them. It's it's punishment. And it's so hard to see it as happening for you, as a promotion, as a protection of something you may not be wise enough to know. And uh, that general paradigm shift, that paradox that you talked about in the first book that you, you recommend was one of the Tao, uh, of the inside, the paradoxical way the universe works uh, yeah. and the people work. And that paradox has helped Damon, yourself and I uh, help other people to achieve their potential. And, you know, that takeaway of that paradox uh, was quite clear with Damon uh, that, you know, we have everything happening for us or even through us. And we have to have faith and pay those debts but once the debts are paid, we're going to come out the other side to a bigger, brighter, better place. And Rick, you make me better every single week. I cannot wait. Uh, incredible season so far. Check it out on Apple TV. Game, set, life. My best friend and hero all wrapped up in one. The incredible Rick Macy. Rick Macy Tennis Academy. Everyone go down there and join him in Florida. Even though it's hot, he remains cool. And he's an incredible middle-aged mutant rapper like me. Thanks for joining me, Rick. All right. Love it, Dave. We're not going next Tuesday. It's next, the following Friday. You got it following Friday. We got our Wimbledon Green. Check it out. He's picking the joke to win. So uh, I can tell the goat is there. He's ready to go. Thanks, Rick. We'll see you soon. All right. See you soon. Right on. All right. From Italy, it doesn't matter where we're at. We're around the world. We have incredible guests. But moreover, we have the incredible... Rick Macy joining me, David Meltzer, with Game, Set, Life. I always like to finish up with the same simple statement of being more interested than interesting. Remember, most importantly, though, be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. Hit it, Nick. There are times that I may slip up, but we'll always get it right. Guarantee I'll be on top when it's game said life. Get up and show up, don't ever lose your fight. You watching me from the couch, at least I say I tried. A long time ago, someone said this stuck with me. Passion with that action will only remain a dream. Keep positive, motivated people on your team. Cause other negativity can kill your self-esteem. Believing is powerful, but sadly so is doubt. So you can choose which way you want to go, which route. The mind that controls the body can beat anybody. And gotta be all in, don't treat your dreams like a hobby And if you practice on your day off, won't have an off day Talent alone won't get you there, still got a long way Gotta take big risks and big steps to strive Wanna be the winner when it's game set live Whoa